Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Raphael Bostic. I'm a professor here. I hope you all know that by now. Um, and I want to welcome you to the fourth installment of our Social Innovation uh, Lecture Series. Um, this is really designed, as uh, I've said before, to be a discussion by the faculty and others at Price about what social innovation is and, and how should we think about it as we embark upon our new journey with a Center for Social Innovation. Um, we've had three uh, really interesting and thought-provoking presentations uh, or reflections on social innovation to date. And the fourth is today, and uh, I'm very excited and pleased to have Zav Briggs here uh, as the presenter. Um, just so you know, um, I've known Zav for 14 years. Um, I met him when I uh, did a little detail at HUD, and I would have to say that if there's one person who's responsible for me going off to Washington and doing uh, the things that I did as an assistant secretary, is this man. Um, he, uh, so it's your fault. Um, and uh, he, was, uh, he was there as well. So um, uh, while I was at HUD, he was at the Office of Management and Budget as an associate director, and he oversaw basically about half the government in terms of their budgets, uh, six or seven agencies, uh, plus two uh, or three of the specialty agencies like Small Business Administration. Uh, he's seen quite a bit um, and um, is now an associate professor at MIT. Um, he is one of the more interesting uh, people who I've ever spoken with, has very good um, and interesting perspectives on how communities work, and uh, the role of race and class in that, uh, and uh, has thought quite a bit about um, how, how social uh, communities function and uh, what innovation looks like. Um, so um, we're very excited to have him. Please join me in welcoming Tom Briggs. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's a delight to be here. Uh, I want to thank Raphael and, and, and Richard at the center and really the whole team at the, at the Price School for the invite and the chance to uh, share some ideas with you. And I hope this is useful for your deliberation. I understand a, a good part of my charge to be uh, sort of providing fodder for puzzle solving in this space. Uh, what is social innovation? Uh, what contribution can this school and the, and the center make? Which I think is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's a luxury that you um, can zoom out and, and invite people in, and I'm, I'm privileged to be a part of that. Uh, my friend Rafael Bostic has many gifts. Keeping expectations low is not one of them. Um, and in all seriousness, um, before I go on, I want to thank USC for loaning us Rafael Bostic for a couple of years. Uh, he was a joy to work with and made just, um, he's too modest to ever talk about it much, but just enormous contributions, and it's one of those people that not only had great ideas, but you know what I mean by this next phrase, got things done, knew how to do it, commanded enormous respect uh, uh, by the HUD secretary and, and everyone in the White House. And uh, it's a delight to, uh, to, to be here and to be able to work with him at least a little bit again. Um, I want to break with academic uh, tradition and hope I don't make anyone uncomfortable uh, here today, but I would I would like to answer the question posed by my title very directly, um, rather than build up to it in some mysterious way. Um, and I'd like to do so uh, rather immediately, which is particularly unusual in, in our business. So the, the question I pose for you, pose for myself today, is do social innovators produce social change? And the answer to that, I would argue, is very often not. Um, uh, at least not often enough. I think there are other things that social innovators or, or people that get labeled that uh, do produce, and a whole lot of it has to do with things like efficiency improvements. Um, and I'll say why I think that is in, in just a moment. But, um, you know, I think n not enough and not often enough is the quick answer to the question. And I'd like to uh, outline why I think that and, you know, and, and why it happens to be the case. Um, and also, in the next 30 or 40 minutes, um, also look at some alternatives to the sort of received wisdom on what social innovation is or how it gets defined. And again, hope all of that is, 
is useful uh, to you. One of the first questions I think you need to, to ask um, if social change is, is the interest is, is what is it? You know, what do we uh, want uh, from social change? Why do we want it? What do we mean uh, by it? And of course, this piece is, this piece of the talk anyway, is a little bit more traditionally academic, wherein you um, spend 90 minutes critiquing the term. I won't quite take that long, but I, I would like to examine what this label has, has often meant. And uh, because I think it, it gives us some interesting purchase on the question of what is social innovation and how can social innovation affect social change more often and in more useful ways. Well, conventional definitions of social change tend to emphasize uh, shifts in things like basic rights, you know, the, the basic charter of, of society, you know, the sorts of things the civil rights movement aimed to influence, to name one example. Um, and also institutions and, and attitudes, uh, things that motivate people broadly, and if you will, the tectonics of society, right? Things that then influence um, choices they make in their private lives, um, who they vote for, how much they get engaged in politics, all kinds of fundamentals along those lines. And, and very often the mechanisms for producing those kinds of social change, if we look at the course of American history, have been social movements. Um, you know, in, in the way that academics think about them and define them, social movements press claims from outside of government. They, they create a groundswell, create a base, um, build a wave of support, and their success, so the students of social movements tell us, sociologists and political scientists and others, their success is contingent on a number of things, like what's the opportunity structure you know, for change? Um, what resources is the movement really able to mobilize? And you can sort of characterize different movements um, and the resources that they mobilize in different ways. The labor movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, gay rights movement, go on down the list, and timing also matters. So people that think about social change that gets produced by movements <coughs> tend to look at, at that array of things. And if I had to characterize in, in terms that I hope are, are simple without being oversimplified, I'd say the trajectory of change is outside to inside, meaning outside the state, but very much focused on the state, on government, as a keeper of the charter of basic rights. Um, not just sort of uh, you know, broadly aimed at changing the way civil society operates or the way, public, the way people think in a society, but making some fundamental changes through the government as an instrument. At least that's traditionally been a central part of the theory of change, the big picture theory of change for, for movement builders. Um, and another source of, of social change by the conventional definition, I would argue, uh, are cultural innovations. Um, Elizabeth and I had a nice conversation this morning about, about this sort of thing, uh, which I don't think academics think about all that much, and I don't think people in policy schools or planning programs like the one I teach in think about these all that much, and we need to. Um, and by cultural innovations, I'm referring uh, to everyday practices and things that people take to be normal. And what we know, again, from rigorous study of cultural change uh, is that migrants tend to make a difference. Um, in other words, it's often when you add newcomers to a, to a place um, and they bring new practices, they bring new habits, that that can drive a certain amount of change. One interesting historical example of that, just to give you a, a big picture sense of this, is how does a society, how does the US of A, a society in which the the animating culture uh, was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture um, driven in many ways most powerfully by religious reformers in the early days in places like Massachusetts, which by the way were extremely strict and intolerant. I would argue that the closest thing we ever had to a Spanish Inquisition on this continent was the, the, the Puritan uh, cities of Massachusetts. Um, the best one-liner on this, by the way, is by the comedian Robin Williams who said the the Puritans were so uptight, even the British kicked them out. Um, th that may be unfair to the British, and I apologize. It is not unfair to the Puritans. They were a, a rough group. Well, how do you, how exactly do you get from that to kind of the culture of, of leisure, you know, of Saturday afternoon, watching football, baseball, drinking beer, 
having fun that are also thought of now as part of kind of core mainstream American culture. And one of the answers to that is German cultural customs. Um, a large German in-migration of people who brought that culture of, of leisure and of conviviality and celebration, and yes, beer drinking, and um, to what had been this very, very intolerant, you know, very almost purient uh, sort of culture about how people should spend their private lives. And that's one example among a zillion, right, of how American culture migrates over time. Um, and then there are other, you know, f uh, types of, of cultural in innovation. And I want to come back to what it would mean to, to think more seriously about that as a source of social change. Not to say we can always control where it goes, but to, to not leave it out of our equation, not leave it off the screen, because I think we often do. Um, and in this, in this realm, I would argue the trajectory is quite different from the social movement uh, uh, realm or, or pathway. The trajectory is, is about adoption uh, in what we call popular culture. So it's adoption at the individual or household level of a different way of, of thinking and behaving. And typically, there's been little or no role for the state formally. <laughs> Uh, except maybe around, you know, changing uh, prohibitions on things like alcohol uh, consumption or, or what have you. You know, viewed in this context that I've been outlining so far, social movements on one hand, cultural innovation, these broader sources of change in the tectonics of society, I would argue that much of what gets labeled social innovation these days and much of the focus of social innovators seems more like creative coping to me than social change. And I think that's unfortunate. And I don't argue that because I think coping is a bad thing. I, in our personal lives and as a society, we often need to cope with very difficult conditions. We'd be in trouble if we couldn't cope. But coping is not enough. And I sort of want to take the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so to develop this idea a bit with you. And then again, it, it really, what I really look forward to is, is, is the conversation. But that's that's the overall uh, claim I want to make. You know, it's very often creative coping, not, in fact, social change. And that's unfortunate. And we can do better than that. Uh, or at least I'm convinced um, that we can. Well, you know, if I'm right at all about that, let me ask, how did we get here? In other words, what get, if I've talked a bit about social change so far and compared it to what uh, I claim social innovators do, well, what exactly is labeled social innovation? I mean, how do we r relate these, these two? Or put differently, what counts as social innovation, the way we are using that phrase often, um, especially in America? Um, well, number one, it, it's often a particular kind of entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, nonprofit startups, uh, or perhaps, um, you know, double or triple bottom line, as they're called, businesses, right? Businesses that are trying to add some form of social impact to what otherwise would be just a profit maximizing single bottom line. And I think, you know, this has borne a certain amount of fruit, but it also has engendered some, some blind spots. On this issue of entrepreneurship, I happen to be a fan of Howard Stevenson's definition. Stevenson kind of got there early and realized that no one had a really great definition, at least in in, in kind of the, the business world, in the world of business education. Uh, this is decades ago. And the conclusion he came to, um, and certainly many others have built on and extended this, is that entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity, I'm directly quoting him here, the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources currently controlled. The pursuit of opportunity beyond resources currently controlled. I think that's a very, very useful uh, definition and I think that entrepreneurship is a very useful and important function because it is so centrally focused on calculated risk taking that leads to growth. And yes, some of that can produce real innovation and, and real change, but some of it doesn't, or quite a lot of it doesn't. Um, and let me, go, let me go further than that. I would argue that entrepreneurship is not, it's not intrinsically aligned with innovation per se let alone with, with social change. In other words, it's about risk taking and a whole lot of entrepreneurs kind of start something, it starts small and it frankly stays small, but it's their thing, you know, they run it. And you will hear politicians of every stripe, uh, and this goes way back in American politics at all levels, local, state, national, um, venerating the entrepreneur, uh, venerating the small businessman or businesswoman and there are great reasons to do that, but there are often things that politicians don't tell you, like uh, 
most entrepreneurs, most businesses in this country um, start and stay small. Most of them don't grow, for example. Small businesses are the number one source of new jobs. It's true, uh, or they're the number one job creators. They're also the number one job destroyers. Politicians don't campaign on phrases like that. <laughs> I'm allowed to say it. You know, I'm not, not campaigning for office at the moment. But um, when I say job destroyers, what I mean is there's so much churning going on. So many small businesses are being born and failing every single day. Um, you know, that the, the rest of the story, kind of how you get to growth, is often left out. And that, to me, is sort of the more interesting side of the equation. But I've, I've done this little, if you will, digression into business for a couple minutes here just to make the point that entrepreneurship is not intrinsically aligned with innovation. It's something broader. Um, and a lot of entrepreneurship doesn't lead to anything all that innovative um, or all that, all that growth oriented. And yet, these concepts of innovation and entrepreneurship are highly linked in the, way that we, in the way that we think about them. Not only, it turns out, in the business sector, but in the so-called social sector as well. And I think that's problematic in some ways. Um, our history, I think, explains why, and I won't dwell on it, but we know, especially as we sit here in California, the kind of the iconic companies, um, Apple Computer and others, that have created in the public imaginary this powerful association uh, between technology, the startup, the promise of growth, and all of those things. But it's, you know, to some extent hijacked the conversation, and it leaves me to note um, that if we want real social change, and our phrasing around social innovation or our association for social innovation has been so captured, in some ways circumscribed by the entrepreneurship uh, conversation, it's then not at all obvious what the boundaries of social innovation ought to be. To me, it's still up for grabs, which is one reason I'm excited about the, the inquiry that, that you're engaged in. Now, in practice, we have looked, it seems to me, to the creators of new products and services that have some kind of social impact um, when we describe social innovation or social innovators, whether it be micro lending in some sort of peer group support model. I did work in the early part of my career as an academic on social capital which uh, really sparked, it. not my work in particular, but um, you know, there was a fascination, especially in the late 90s, with social capital to the point where it was sort of being talked about as a cure-all right, um, for society's ills. And this was a global phenomenon, by the way, not just an American one, but Grameen was using peer networks in particular ways. Um, and that was part of, of, of its model for succeeding in very measurable financial terms. So that's an example of a new you know, a new product, uh, the placement of high achieving college students in school districts that otherwise would struggle or had been struggling to recruit that kind of talent. Teach for America, another new product or, or service, uh, particular kinds of network-based anti-violence work or violence prevention, Operation Ceasefire, capital O, capital C. So these are the kinds of things we have described as social innovations, tend to be new products and services and in uh, fields linked to community development, and I know that's an important part of the, uh, of the schools and the center's agenda and the concerns of the Price family and whatnot, um, neighborhood revitalization, creating opportunity, and wonderfully so, um, in America and especially in the fields that tend to link to community development and of equitable urban change, um, there's been a heavy concentration of those kinds of social innovations in education and child and youth programming, and to a lesser extent, I would argue, financial services and public safety. Not that any of those are unimportant, but again, I'm just trying to sort of outline the landscape here. And I'm gonna to argue to you that as useful as that stuff is, it's, it's, it's limited. It's, it's a, a, you know, a, a modest part of how we actually ought to be thinking about and promoting social innovation. And what worries me about this, this gets more to the limits, is that very often we're describing as social innovators the people who are incubating excellent services of one kind or another. They're kind of crafting it on a small scale and then trying to envision and achieve, trying to scale their, their stuff, right? <laughs> These phrases are, are commonly used. Some of those services are excellent, some are not, and the whole theory is that the ones that are not ought to kind of by competition just fall by the wayside. I'm not sure that actually happens, by the way. I think that's a bit of an open question, but that's the way it's supposed to work. 
Some of them uh, seem to scale. Um, many do not, or not without uh, you know, overwhelming force or particularly uh, powerful political backers and, and whatnot. But again, overwhelmingly, they're, they're products or programs, and they can be measured in their impacts in fairly standardized ways, things like financial performance, violence reduction, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the thing, as I speak to a, a room of fellow academics and, and students in the, in the broad sense, um, we've relied to a great degree, let's be honest, on business school models of these things uh, to have a conversation about, about social innovation, how to both uh, refine it and improve it and also scale it or, or ensure greater impact. And in particular, this association between innovation, entrepreneurship, growth, and the measurement of impact. I mean, they've been heavily dominated, I would argue, by, by business school models and by business schools uh, as teachers of, quote unquote, social innovation. I think, to sum up what I've been talking about in, in this portion of the, of the talk, I think this strong association and this kind of rooting in business schools, um, at least in recent decades, has at least one major virtue and two major problems. The virtue, I think, is the relentlessness about one's value proposition and an impact strategy for delivering on that. I think that's quite healthy. Um, I think that in the arena, you know, broadly defined as social change, it can be quite tricky to get people to be specific about what their goals are and how exactly they're going to achieve them. Um, to be relentless about the details. And maybe it's the recovering engineer in me, but I like to be relentless about the details. I think that adds value to society. You need people that are hugely imaginative and inspiring and you know, who are great at, at, at working the narrative and persuading at, at a higher level. And I think, again, of great movement leaders when I talk about that. But believe, believe me, beneath them, working around them, you had people who were penciling out the numbers and getting the volunteers to the event and logistics and all of that infrastructure is also enormously important. By the way, the, the two political parties have discovered that in a very serious way over the last two election cycles. Think of how much of the conversation debriefing the outcomes has been about the get out the vote operations. I mean, very, very specific kind of logistical strategies and approaches, not just policy platforms. Um, so the virtue is this relentlessness about value proposition, impact strategy, performance. Again, core business school stuff. Not only that, but um, you know, very often kind of the stock and trade of, of business schools. Here are the two problems I see, though. Number one, it obscures uh, this association and this kind of hegemony obscures other mechanisms and strategies of change. And beyond that, I would argue, even leads to a certain uh, amount of diversion of, uh, uh, of intellectual energy, of public attention, of dollars, and of talent. And I'm hugely concerned about that last one. Um, into a comparatively narrow model of, of social innovation and a narrow set of reference points. Um, one of the many prices we pay for that, it seems to me, is that a huge number of people that identify strongly with this phrase, social innovation, to the point that they name their career goal as being a social innovator, you know, committing to that as a field, or at least they imagine it to be a field, um, do not seriously consider service in government at all. And in some instances, have no theory of politics. Um, and in some instances, to go a little further, believe that they can accomplish their goals without politics and engagement with government, uh, which, I, which I think is, is quite naive you know, in, many, in many instances. So that's one problem I see. It's, a, it's an obscuring, it's a, it's a diversion of, of many precious things, including talent and personal commitment. And problem number two, it seems to me, is that it also generates hefty incentives to oversell how much transformative impact is actually going on. And this gets back to the, the claim I made that a lot of social innovation is about creative coping, really, much more than, than social change. Um, I think that along with this heavy association between innovation and entrepreneurship and the business models for uh, both of those things comes a, a culture of, of marketing. Uh, to a great extent, and that sometimes it really is, is overdone. If you think about how we teach uh, grade schoolers or high schoolers math, you know, we think it's pretty important that kids learn the difference between a, a, a local maximum and a global maximum. 
um, which I'm using as a metaphor here, you want to know if you're on the highest hill in the neighborhood, which is exactly 13 feet high, versus right the top of Mount Whitney or something. And it, I think it's important if we care about social change and transformative social impact to be honest with ourselves about when we are investing a whole lot of energy and time and talent in things that um, often start and stay at the 13 foot, 20 foot level, as opposed to really representing the heights, uh, changing the tectonics of our society. Um, and I want to get back in a moment to how we might do some of those things, because I do think we have to go beyond this kind of dominant, dominant model. But a lot of social program theories of change, to me, fall in this category. I've, I've been a part of, for a little over a decade now, something called the Aspen Roundtable on Community Change. They focused a lot of their work on uh, neighborhood level change. They were associated with the rise of the so-called comprehensive community initiatives in the late 80s, early 90s, and tried to kind of systematize that and offer the field, you know, collective wisdom and, and so on. And, uh, you know, did yeoman work at trying to bring theories of change? Can you be specific about the causes and effects that you think will produce some change that you want to produce? Every kid in our neighborhood is going to arrive in school ready to learn at age five, would be an example of a specific target. Um, or fill in the blank, something around financial literacy, right, and being banked, um, or something else, a safety target or something else. Again, great to have specific targets, specific strategies. Um, but if you think about it, a, a theory of change along those lines, so what do we have to do exactly to get every kid in the neighborhood? Let's work backward from what it would take to actually produce that result. They risk, um, they risk being those kind of local foothills you know, a, a very rigorously achieved modest result in a bigger picture that has still, right over the course of the last decades, continued to produce uh, astounding economic inequality um, and uh, a, a profound disengagement from government, distrust of government and disengagement from politics and all these larger processes that are crucial to change, even as we got a whole lot better at incubating excellent programs and new services and products as a part of that. Now, there is another side to the story. And I was saying to Elizabeth that I, I think there's been a, a real chasm here. There have been you know, two conversations, and I think the fact that there's a schism between them or a chasm between them is a part of the problem in this, in this area of social innovation. <coughs> there's the innovation in government side to the story. And it's been evolving. Um, you know, I think back to the Ford Foundation's efforts in the 1990s to create a competitive program to recognize, to celebrate innovations in government and the innovators behind them and to document that. I think that's all positive. I was a, a judge for, for that competition one year. Uh, there were something like 1,600 applications for, for 10 award spots. I mean, it became highly competitive, a really prestigious thing to win. I learned some interesting things. I will share with you that I, one of my takeaways from that experience is that, um, again, a lot of people are not thinking beyond their backyard and their kind of local reference points all that much. Some of what got sent in uh, as, as innovative was uh, innovative in county X or innovative in state Y, not innovative for government generally. And a lot of people just didn't know when they were producing something that was truly innovative uh, more broadly had not been done before, a lot of what got sent in was just, frankly, just good government, not especially innovative. You know, there was nothing especially new being done, just really good delivery. Um, I think this is evolving. I think that, and I say this in particular with, you know, your work in, in public policy and public management and planning in mind, I think we've seen more intellectual attention paid to this set of issues and not just by people who have historically worried about the public sector and its, and its performance. But, uh, you know, it is my sense, I wonder whether it's yours as well, that this really has been operating as a conversation separate and apart from the social entrepreneurship, nonprofit startup uh, sort of world to a great degree. Um, and, it, and it need not be so. Uh, to make reference to Obama uh, briefly, this president created the first ever White House Office of Social Innovation. It's called Social Innovation and Civic Participation. And it's, it's always tricky when you compose a White House. It's not unique to this president. He's not the first to face it. Just what do you co-locate in these shops, frankly? You know, what do they stand for? What do they do? And I, I have to say that while you know, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, uh, worked closely with the original uh, director of that office, Sonal Shaw, 
to think about how we could bring innovation into big bureaucratic systems uh, like the ones operating in the agencies that I oversaw. Even that office, though, if you, if you look, and I did what any self-respecting academic would do, I did my research on the web um, before coming to talk with you, because <laughs> it's on the internet, it must be true. And the, the White House office, as of now, not just you know, back when, when, when I was in office and, and dealing with folks, the, the public story that the web tells, uh, and that is the story that most people see and hear, um, very much emphasizes this sort of grassrootsy, you know, uh, startup model and links it again to service, to volunteerism, which is a, a fine thing. Um, but service is not yet in our country a truly transformative force on a large scale. I think it could be, by the way, but it is not that yet for a whole host of reasons. And so I think that even there, you know, having a White House office, to some extent, we are not realizing the full, the full potential. I think we could adopt, here's the last part of what I want to share with you, I think we could adopt a broader and much more strategic paradigm or framework, if you will, for thinking about, about social innovation. I think if we want to do that, what we ought to do, what engineers would call reverse engineering, um, work backward from the range of changes we'd actually like to see, and we might disagree on some of them, but that's, that's okay. At least consider broadly the kinds of changes we actually need and, and figure out from that what the multiple mechanisms are. More than one model, okay? So this is an argument for, for pluralism. Uh, and in particular, for intellectual centers, centers of creative thought and, and social action like this one, to be engaged actively in that process of broadening the, uh, broadening the lens, opening the aperture, and pursuing uh, more than one model in terms of, in terms of impact. Um, and I'm gonna lay out for you a, uh, a four-part framework, very briefly and promise you we will come across in this framework, in this landscape, yeah, we'll come across the startups and the service innovators, um, but I think they're a piece of, of something larger and more multi-dimensional, or ought to be, more to the point. Um, so one type of innovation, it seems to me, that would need to be on our screen is institutional innovation, and it isn't often enough. I can give you many examples of this. I, I'm gonna limit myself today to just three, very briefly, um, one is in the area of equitable urban development, <coughs> which I've done some work on and care deeply about. Um, things like community benefits agreements, um, things that change the, the fundamental rules and the roles and the way in which development happens, that kind of change the script. Again, see my early remarks, start to change the norms for how deals get cut, how investments on a large scale get done. Uh, are institutional innovations. They're fundamentally different, it seems to me, from um, excellent practices, like a different math curriculum, right? Or a Grammy model of lending or, or that sort of thing. Because they pot potentially change urban development itself. They create a new normal uh, if they're successful and if we understand them and we back them and so on. Here's another example, race to the top. Now, I'm not asking you, by the way, as an old friend of mine used to like to say, you don't have to own any of these ideas, just rent them for the next 10 minutes, okay? I want you to rent for the next couple of minutes the idea that race to the top is an institutional innovation of tremendous promise. Whatever you think of its education policy content, which is not why I'm raising it. I'm raising it because it upends the way that competitive grant making is usually done. And here, from a former OMB guy, from a former White, White House guy, Here's my version of, of why it's innovative and, and transformative. What Race to the Top said in education, and it could say this in many more fields, that's my point, uh, what Race to the Top said was, you need to enact a set of reforms to qualify to compete. In other words, this is a contest to qualify initially. You've gotta enact tough reforms, things you've been avoiding for years, things you haven't been able to agree on. You've gotta do that first. And then we will consider you for the money. And by the way, we're very clear given what we want to do. We want to hold out this, it's kind of like an X prize in a sense, right? We want to hold out this substantial sum of money, a sum of money that would let you do something truly transformative, not incremental. We know, given the funds available, that we're only going to be able to make a couple of those grants. You're only going to be a few lottery winners. 
Yeah, but the, the beauty of this is um, that even the lottery losers benefit from the reforms. So you, you all of a sudden run something now in which you don't just get you know, a handful of, of, of sort of a lucky few who got the dollars uh, and have some strategy and start to pursue it, and a lot of others who didn't, though they had grand plans. You have a bunch of lottery losers that have far more than a grand plan. They've actually enacted reforms. They can get on with the business of changing the way they run their school systems. Uh, all in the way you designed the institution that was this, um, was this resource allocation. At the end of the day, that's what it is. It's a resource allocation model for, for the federal government. And I think we could apply that much more broadly to many other, many other fields. The conditions have to be right, but, but we could do it. Here's one last example. It goes back to urban development a little bit, and it's value capture. So it's a, it's a concept in real estate and, and urban planning. And you know the world's, arguably the world's most aggressive adopter of this? It's not an American city. It's not even a European city. Um, <coughs> it's Colombian cities. I mean, talk about kind of an unexpected terrain given the civil war in Colombia and all the drug trafficking and everything else and the instability and the problems that Colombia has faced in recent decades. Uh, several of their cities um, have in fact been eager adopters and utilizers of the concept that if we as the public sector invest significantly in transforming urban <coughs> space and we know that's going to create private benefits, in other words, it's going to accrue partly as a, as a gain to private property holders, we, the public investor, ought to capture some of that upside and route it back into community development. We ought to upgrade the schools. We ought to have wonderful libraries, even in poor neighborhoods. We ought to go down the list. So they've built that into now. It's kind of like a cousin to the community benefits agreement I was, uh, the example I was giving, but it is far more codified into the finances and it has a much more powerful fiscal dimension to it um, than most community benefits agreements do for changing the way urban development itself happens. It's a very interesting institutional innovation that they have, that they have uh, refined and adopted on a wider scale. So institutional innovation would be my first category. My second would be the more familiar programmatic innovations. They, they tend to be centered on, on new practices, typically in the form of a service or a product, like an operation ceasefire, uh, like uh, you know, Teach for America, like a, a first accounts model or some low cost model to get the unbanked banked, right? Something that changes typically the overhead costs for a bank of providing small checking accounts or savings accounts or, or that kind of thing. All good for the world, but again, the, the programmatic innovations, it seems to me, are, are just a piece. A, a third category would be physical uh, innovation and its importance for social change. And here is an open question, you know, just what exactly the link is. I, I wouldn't be an MIT guy if I didn't include technology in the traditional sense. Um, smart energy meters for homes, low-cost disaster-resistant housing, green roofs, um, you know, solar cookers that can be used in the most remote parts of Africa and Asia and are durable and are uh, easy to maintain and have all those other traits. You know, yes, if adopted on a wide scale, people in the wider development world and the business world call it bottom of the pyramid stuff. How many of you are familiar with that phrase? Okay, bottom of the pyramid refers to the uh, income pyramid. So it's the billions of people in the world who get by on a dollar or $2 or $3 a day essentially as a almost completely overlooked market in the global economy and what it means to engineer for the bottom of the pyramid and to uh, strategically pursue things like the diffusion of innovation and, you know, and sales and sales networks for very, very, very low income people and create benefits at that level and not ignore them and their lives. Um, so I think there really are some progressive implications of, of technology. But there again, we can easily drink the Kool-Aid. We can get a little distracted about the power of technology alone to transform social conditions. The final type of innovation is one of the first that I mentioned in this talk, and I didn't give you much in the way of examples. Cultural innovation. I think it's really powerful, and I say this in part, again, conscious that I'm, I'm giving this talk in, in Los Angeles, um, one of the world's capitals of uh, what social scientists would call cultural cultural production. It's one of, uh, don't get too excited, it's one of our many catchy social science uh, shorthands, cultural production. Um, you know, what does that mean? This is everything from 
Oprah and what she did to reinvent what a daytime talk show could be in, in popular entertainment to something like uh, the designated driver practice. It is a practice. People have to do specific things. They have to hand the keys to someone and you know, mutually agree on who gets to drink tonight and who, who doesn't and keeps everyone safe and that sort of thing. And what many people do not realize is that was a specific invention. It was invented in a public health school. It was then shot to Hollywood screenwriters who wrote it into scripts, which helped to popularize it enormously. Uh, excuse me, enormously. It helped to literally normalize, to create a new norm in the society in a way that's um, profoundly different from the traditional regulatory approach. You, know, you tell people not to do something, then you deploy a very limited number of, of public officials, state highway patrol, et cetera, et cetera, who cannot possibly be everywhere you know, preventing all this stuff. Um, and then you hope for the best. And the, the invention of that cultural practice was transformative. What kinds of cultural innovations do we need? You know, one guy's opinion. But I think we need many. I think we need many things that are not the province or the purchase of institutional innovations necessarily or new social programs uh, or new physical technologies. Um, I think we need innovations that make STEM fields really compelling and exciting for kids, especially kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. I don't think we've hit on how to do that yet. Um, I think we badly need it. I think we need to universalize the idea of parents as, as first educators. There's a lot of cultural work in that. Um, and I don't think that culture should be a dirty word when we say that. It's not about blaming people for not you know, having certain practices at home. It's about getting on with the business of making everyone invested in, um, in learning from the earliest years in life, even before preschool, even before what the president was proposing recently, right? That we go universal with high quality pre-K. I'm talking about first three months, first six months of life, first couple of years, universalizing the parent as first educator. Here's um, uh, a few ideas about alternatives, and I'll, I'll end on this and welcome your reactions and, and questions if any of this has been, <coughs> has been useful. Final question. Under what conditions would social innovators more broadly defined, in, in the way I've defined them, uh, would they actually produce useful social change? I think that's an interesting question. But I do think conditions matter. Um, is the old saying, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I don't personally run around looking at every problem as being a social movement problem necessarily or a cultural innovation problem. Or I, I try to keep an open mind about it and, and think about different ways to achieve social change. I think number one, or my, my first installment on the answer to that question is when we're open as to the trajectory of change, as to the pathway that change um, uh, might pursue or the pathway that might produce the change. Um, even, by the way, in the programmatic category, which I uh, have argued has absorbed too much our attention or has monopolized our attention, might be a better way to, s to say it. Um, community policing, for example, didn't emerge because some nonprofit social innovator uh, crafted a new practice and then shopped it to government. It uh, originated because a group of people observing that police departments were all under severe duress and perhaps had reached the limits of what was known as the 911 model of policing, where you dialed in an emergency and the patrol car would come out quickly. That was the dominant model of policing in this country for years and years and years. Observing the police departments had hit a wall with that model, you know, a thoughtful group of people composed a group made up of both leading lights in the police field, practitioners, together with uh, criminologists and some thoughtful observers that brought a kind of critical distance. And they invented community policing, working together. And then it disseminated, it got diffused, it got adopted uh, from there. So even in that programmatic category, I think we need to, be, need to be open as to the different kinds of pathways that can produce the change we want to see. Number two, I would argue, it's when we spot openings for broader institutional shifts. We look for multipliers. We look for opportunities to do some mimicry, some wider testing of a potentially transformative idea. I would humbly argue or humbly suggest that race to the top is that kind of thing. I don't think we ought to race around, a, a, no point intended, run around applying it to every single kind of problem, I think we ought to be curious, intellectually curious and very practical about the kinds of fields and the kinds of moments in which a race to the top institutional innovation could be 
could be really uh, transformative. I would argue, by the way, and I, I did more than argue, I encouraged and actively supported in one of the president's budgets the application of race to the top in the field of transportation and transformational urban form and urban development and clean energy. But there's a set of things there that we know if people would adopt them on a wider level, would take a chance on some stuff, would demonstrate in their regions that it can work, that that would have a snowball effect. But they don't make that first move. Are you with me? They don't make that first risk, take that first step. Um, and not to, you know, not to parody it too much, but again, in this field that I've worked in for a number of years in urban policy, if you start your sentence with, it worked in Portland, I mean, to American cities, that's like saying it worked in Finland. You know what I mean? It's, it's not just not made here. It's, they're nothing like us. You know, their people are entirely... Anyway, um, sometimes you need to provide the air cover from above. And institutional innovations can be an important, important part of that. And finally, here's my last thought for you. And, and, and I'd love you to hear this last piece as a bit of an invocation, as one educator to, to others, as one student to others. Um, I think that if we ask ourselves under what conditions would social innovators actually produce useful social change and on a much bigger scale, it's where we build out things like systems and career paths for systems of innovation in the public sector. It's where we grab a hold of that issue, which has been, I think, too compartmentalized and too much a conversation among public management types to a great degree, and we open it up um, and we engage the public more broadly in that conversation, engage philanthropy in that conversation, engage um, other sources of risk-taking and, and intellectual energy and uh, political support and, and more. Um, one of the best ways I think we could do something about the looming shortage of talented public sector workers, the whole question of the, the future of civil service in this country, at many levels, and Raphael and I have both served at at HUD, he can tell you, it is one of the oldest agencies in the federal government. An enormous share of all of its staff are eligible to retire now or in the next couple of years. It's a huge question, who will replace those folks and how you can engage and retain young talent, including people who respond to this phrase, social innovation. They are grabbed by that idea, right? They're really compelled and inspired by that idea, but they don't think that has much at all to do with, with the public sector or serving and working out problems in government, one piece of doing that, I would argue, and here I promise is the last, last thought, one piece of doing that would be rethinking what, what we've been calling in government and in public management the public trust, what it means to manage for the public trust. Um, the shorthand, you know, at least in recent decades, has been that the, the public trust refers not to the creative side of what government does, the enabling stuff, but things like minimizing waste, fraud, and abuse, like the prevention of bad stuff, if I'm making sense, as opposed to the accomplishment of objectives through creativity and innovation. Um, now, the public trust, for given reasons, especially if the public is mistrustful of government or uh, accurately perceives in some instances that there is corruption in government and waste in government and, and inefficiency um, or out-and-out -out abuse of, of public powers, the public trust is enormously important, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we should somehow de-emphasize this, but I do think we need to reinvent it. You know, I think that there has been a, a migration uh, over time, a shift in government to a, a compliance orientation. It's seen quite severely in agencies like HUD that have challenging missions about which the American public is frankly quite ambivalent. Um, and it leads to a hunkering down behavior. It leads to a large number of otherwise uh, you know, well-intended, hardworking public servants taking no chances because chances will come back to bite you. Some congressman or congresswoman will call you out in a hearing, will expose the agency. We need a kind of 21st century risk management to emerge. The private sector understands that concept quite well. You have to take risks. You know, no risk, no reward. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, if we paralyze government, not just with things like partisan gridlock, but essentially by you know, pursuing a model in which it is not in anybody's interest to take any serious risk, where is the innovation going to come from? Um, I, I'm not hopeful. So on that bright note, <laughs> I, I hope this has been useful to you. Again, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And if, if there's time, I hope I haven't run over. 
Um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts and take your questions. Thanks very much. surprised that one of your four or five wasn't policy. Mm. It was institutional, it was other and cultural, all of which are important. Mm. But I was surprised that it, given in some sense that you want to tie in some way innovation and take it out of the programmatic, that it's one of the frustrations I think is trying to move it towards the institutionalization of action, which would be through policy often. Yep. And why not? Uh, fair enough. I, I think it's uh, an oversight on my part. I, I associate it with that programmatic dimension. I totally agree with you. It, it can change the calculus instantly on scale and institutionalization in the broad sense, which of course is what the incubators of excellent services hope for. Right. It, it, it kind of is it. that thing where it stays at service yes. and doesn't move up. You know, they, they often think of it as a service rather well, than as a policy. I think you make a great point. I, I think so far, I want to think about this some more, but I think I would um, associate it analytically with the programmatic dimension and, and, you know, and think of that as program come policy. And as you know, I'm sure it can work in either directions. There are times when something gets grabbed and quickly made into policy. And sometimes we like that, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes it kind of outruns our knowledge base. And there are other instances in which there's lots of experimenting for years and years and otherwise effective programs are struggling for for core support um, and what we need is to mainstream it with policy and you know and a certain amount of, of oversight too you know risk management to make sure that there aren't abuses and, and whatnot so no I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more and I will share with you a very quick story uh, nearly a decade ago I was invited to be a contrarian at a, at a summit of social entrepreneurs and this was a who's who, okay, of, 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 of that world. It was the old guard, which meant at the time young 40-somethings. Um, Wendy Kopp, Teach for America, founder of City Year. Um, very smart, very driven people. They were the old guard. The vanguard was 20-somethings, 20, 20 people who had younger organizations. But again, all came out of this world of kind of the innovative practice, the value proposition, um, a business school centric model, arguably. One of the speakers was, uh, was Porus of Collins and Porus fame, built to last, the, the business text. And again, a lot of really, really interesting conversation. When I say I was invited to be a contrarian, it's because I was on a small panel moderated by David Gergen, um, who brought to that conversation, I thought, a really important and fresh perspective. Um, I was there to sort of challenge people with the idea that if you, you've got a theory of, say, how kids learn, by the age of five, where you got a theory about how to attract talented young America into the teaching profession, or a theory of any of these other kinds of very specific programmatic things, but you have no theory of politics. And your plan is if we build it, they will come. It's a kind of demonstration theory of social change. You've got a problem. You've got a real blind spot. Um, and I think that there have been some healthy changes. I think we have a ways to go, but there have been some healthy changes since then to suggest we can bring these conversations together. People who think about scale and big agencies and policy and policy design and implementation for a living, and others who have been a part of this kind of different, different orbit for a long time. Thanks for your question. Well, let, me, let me challenge you on the, uh, on the politics point, because I think it does, it does flow nicely from the policy question. Um, but I think a social change is something that lasts longer than one administration. Sure. And <coughs> politics can, partisan politics can flip uh, in four years' time yep. and stop these programs and start those programs, and policy is going to start and stop too, which is maybe one reason why you didn't emphasize policy, because it, it, can, it can turn so quickly. But I just, can you, am I right that it's longer term? And, and how do we think about this? Because surely policy can start the ball rolling, yep. and then the ball hopefully <laughs> will keep rolling into the next administration, right. whether they like it or not. Um, but how do, you, how do we think about that in terms of the, the longevity of, of social change? Well, I think that the point you make, I mean, I think it's enormously important. I think that you underscore why it's so important to have the multidimensional view and to see that there are you know, a number of different things that can contribute to social change that represent innovation. They're just different types of, of innovation. 
uh, and policy innovation or, or, or fresh policy designs, policy reform, is just one of them, and it is subject to what you talked about. I also think it fair to say that there is something of a ratcheting effect in public policy. That yes, in some instances you can have, um, you know, a, a change of of politician or party, in the quick undoing of of somebody's prior victory or what felt like a victory, it was not in the end an enduring change. I think that's especially true at the at the at the local level, um, quite frankly, where you you aren't always talking about major new policy adop adoption. Sometimes you know the energy around certain initiatives that sustain the engagement of whomever it is, the faith sector, the business sector, and you know a particular idea of how to do that or why it's important may just go away with the next person next person in office. Um, at the same time, you know, scholars of the policy process also instruct us that, or also have found, that in some areas there's a pretty powerful ratcheting effect. And I think that's pretty clearly this administration's hope with, for example, healthcare reform. That one of the reasons it becomes normalized and becomes a part of our core social contract and even expectation of why government exists is that there will be enough popularity uh, to key elements of it fast enough that even with a shift in party, uh, the other side, and that, that's how we can refer to it, won't be able to undo those big parts, such as, for example, having your kids covered beyond having yourself covered. Um, so there are some instances in which it's, it, there's, an, there's inertia, there's a kind of ratcheting. It's hard to undo the rules once you've changed them, um, or hard to unring the bell. But no, I think you, I think you make a, a, a tremendously important point. And again, even the most uh, innovative policies are not a substitute, it seems to me, for some of these other things that change norms, that change institutions, et cetera. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess I would also argue that there's a, there's a, a, a form of policy leadership that, that may occur at the national level that generates policy at the state and local level. Mm -hmm. Uh, the example I'm thinking of right now is the use of tobacco and C. Everett Koop's leadership in bringing together research that had been accumulating over time about the effects of tobacco. Mm -hmm. It was there, but nobody was doing anything with it. But he provided the policy leadership to bring that information together and push it in our faces and press conference after press conference after press conference. Yep. That generated uh, a lot of action at the state and local level right here in L.A. Marvin Browdy, you know, a member of the city council, uh, who was a distinguished practitioner in this school after he retired, but for more than 30 years, pushed forward policies about constraints on the use of tobacco in public places that had, that, that continues, uh, yep. had momentum, yep. continues, and, and, and changed uh, our social norms as well. That kind of policy influences I think deeply important. You're absolutely right, and and there's an interesting relationship there. I certainly don't uh, assume to uh, presume to be an expert on it, but th this interesting question about which comes first, you know, the policy or the norm, it, it really can work either way if you look at our history. And I think it's important to know that if you care about social change. So I'm wondering. Um, if you have specific suggestions or ideas for how you start bridging the gap between the social innovation community that sort of distrusts government and the government that can scale some of this stuff up. So, you know, it's not that this is necessarily, a, I mean, the trust, the distrust comes from somewhere, right? So Lenke starts off with all of his students by telling them about urban renewal and how terrible this is, and, you know, you go from there to sort of you know, the answer, government is the problem mm -hmm. and, you know, small nonprofit groups are the solution. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of this institutional distrust over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. How do you get people who are interested in service and community development and social innovation, but who really distrust government, how do you get them to think of government and as more traditional politics as a potential venue? I mean, I think they need to better understand it and it's incumbent on us as educators in whatever role we play, whether we actually teach courses or mentor people in organizations, you know, those are educators too, and coaches. Um, I think it's incumbent on us to, to teach more creatively how things function on, on the inside, you know, give people a view. I, I think that the, the thing that is so compelling about social innovation, or one of the things that's so compelling is this sort of opportunity to do your own thing, you know, to have choices 
to set a target and kind of, again, be relentless about impact and work with creative people and shop the idea, you know, all the excitement of kind of putting yourself out there and trying to persuade. Um, again, much as it functions in the for-profit startup world by analogy. But we need to, um, you know, give people a sense that there is more to engaging government as an ally or even an adopter or a scaler than simply pitching something on the policy merits. Um, and that the skills of negotiation, of political management, uh, of being able to make judgments about timing um, are, are enormously important. So for example, there's this phrase, it's sitting there in a now, I don't know, 30-year-old um, classic on the way the policy process works, um, the John Kingdon book, based on research done in the mid-70s um, at the federal level, Policy Entrepreneur. There are real people that, that do this stuff. They have always been important, um, or arguably have been important for a long, long time, and can be important, by the way, at all levels of government. And very often, they are not working in government. That's the whole idea. You know? But there are people that learn enough about the incentives that people in government face, whether they are elected or appointed or civil servants, and think about the ripeness of public issues and understand things like when there's a gap in credible knowledge, and that's the problem they need to work on, or when you just haven't had the three right people in the room at the same time, and you need to make a different kind of conversation happen because there are silos, for example. Policy entrepreneurship <laughs> is, is a craft. It's highly creative. And I think we could turn more people on to that sort of thing and aspiring to be policy entrepreneurs. And they wouldn't even have to give up on working quite locally and working on substantive things that engage real clients or real products and, and those sorts of things. But I, I'll bet if you, again, sort of polled people who have been exposed to social entrepreneurship that many of them have never heard of that concept or have any idea where it originated or the fact that someone literally wrote the book on who are they. I mean, we can go well beyond, don't get me wrong, what that book laid out 30 years ago. But to Kingdon's credit, he literally laid out what kinds of people do these tend to be? What kinds of skills do they need? What are the things they engage in to move policy? You know, navigating in these, in these systems that are, that are quite tricky, where you often don't just need to shop the idea to one person, and then they will rationally adopt it and run with it, because it seems like. So yeah, there's a small example of the sort of thing that I think changes the narrative about what it means to engage government and to work with it and, and around it. Um, there are other things as, as well. Uh, Jim and I had a great conversation earlier, and a piece of it was about these efforts to engage philanthropy and government and the multiple models for it, you know, the, the different ways that philanthropies who are not spurning involvement with the government for whatever set of reasons, they want to achieve systems change, they understand public systems to be central to their own mission or value proposition or what have you. Um, they think they have special knowledge to bring to bear or more flexible funds that if they complemented public funds could make something really special happen. Whatever, they're different, different theories of it and different models for doing it. That, I think, is one of the exciting kind of touch points um, between worlds that, that often operate, you know, separate, separate and apart. And again, um, you know, I think it's no grand mystery how we got here to the, to the chasm or to the divide, but inculcating in each of the sides or parties a healthy respect for what the other faces in the way of incentives and interests and so on is, uh, is a key piece of the puzzle and presumably institutions of higher ed have a, have a role to play in that. Thanks. So kind of building on that a little bit, but how do you, so how do you think about social innovation when there is, like you were saying, this inherent risk management component in government which essentially restricts information? I mean, as academics who are always looking for information on a lot of programs and thinking about them, going through the process of getting uh, information from even friendly administrations is often is often hard. Yep. Um, so in some ways that's counter to notions of innovation, right? And forces people to, like you were saying, one of the criticisms is that there's a naive lack of politics. So it forces them to push towards this approach that is, you know, embodies a lack of politics. So how do we, how do we kind of think about that when we think of social innovation in, in government and, and kind of this ability to even share the information that allows you to be innovative. Well, I'll give you a couple of instincts on that, but first I want to, I want to second, I want to sort of underline, elaborate just a tiny bit on the point you made about, for example, data sharing and disclosure. I mean, we're, we're in the age of WikiLeaks and, and also open government as a movement and a set of institutions and 
um, and I think this is, a, is an important piece of the, of the conversation. I was a part of a, of a convening in Washington, a small one, that was meant, among other things, to sort of give administration officials like me um, access to or exposure to a set of ideas about how we could promote innovation better in government and learn a thing or two, for example, from the way the British have done it, and the way that you know, the British government and other governments have taken risks over the last decade or so in some very, very specific areas. I forget the whole list, but you know, incarceration and health and a number of other uh, things that are clearly important in, in any society. And one of the striking things to me is that ironically, a conversation that was centered on government was at least at the outset, and I had to sort of politely speak up and, and say this, was extremely naive about the point you just made. I mean, why there is a hunkering down, why there isn't just naturally more information sharing. And you know, one way of capturing it at the extreme, and I'm not in saying this trying to justify the behavior of any particular agency, um, you know, sometimes there's just, frankly, a, a non-responsiveness, a, a, a lack of appreciation maybe for what research may offer, you know, uh, or a whole host of other reasons that, that people don't respond, don't share more. But one reason, too, is this, this fear that um, information is a weapon, you know, that it's going to be adversarial. And in Washington, there's even a parlance, parlance for this. Um, Beltway bandits, um, experts for hire, you know, information as ammunition, phrases like, like that. The whole notion that, for example, you can pretty much within 24 hours put out a study showing almost anything that supports what you, and I'm not exaggerating much when I say that, you know, that supports whatever political position, whatever policy you want to back. And that's the real environment we work in. I just thought the conversation you know, had to acknowledge that, that it's not like HUD, SBA, Energy, any number of other agencies we might name, don't rush up to Capitol Hill and share more on their programs because they aren't imaginative enough or don't care about innovation. Their experience is that information sharing uh, is too often deposition-like. You know, someone is fishing for things they can Kind of used to, to batter you on 24-hour cable news or these days Twitter or whatever. And, at, you know, this is small consolation, but let's at least say it. That is unfortunate. Um, it creates a, a very big problem. To answer your question, it, it's my belief that, as in any highly politicized environment, when you sort of you've hit a, a point, hit a stage where that's, that's the normal, right? That sadly, that's uh, often the, the normal operating mode as opposed to the rare exception of the way conversations and information exchanges are happening. Um, essentially, you have to nurture initially quite small coalitions that cross those boundaries. Just enough fellow travelers that want to accomplish something specific. They actually care about important problems. You don't flip a light switch and go overnight to you know, a whole new era of, of kind of information sharing. The Obama administration has tried to, in some ways, flip a light switch. Um, OMB, I forget the exact number, but you know, made public thousands of data sets that previously government had been sitting on for no particular reason. Um, and the first ever chief information of the officer of the United States who worked at OMB um, had been the CIO for the District of Columbia previously you know, pushed us into the world of dashboards, of, you know, easy to use, easy to navigate sorts of things. Again, are they a, a panacea for all that we need from our government? Obviously not, but all it was a part of kind of enabling, right, a different access to information, including things you could access on your smartphone. Things like tracking where was your, you know, uh, naturalization application. The USCIS never used to tell you. You would just wait endlessly. Um, and, and now you could go on your smartphone and it would tell you precisely, you know, what the stage was and all this kind of, so it seems small, but again, changing some practices. In other areas, though, it's harder. Areas like national security, other things that are highly, highly contested, that become these political footballs, um, become highly partisan. And I think, I think history, if it's a guide, even though it may have been a history without Twitter and, and other, you know, new features of the landscape, suggests that it's nurturing coalitions quite patiently at first. And sometimes policy entrepreneurs who are not in government can play a real role in this, be conveners 
kind of build a constituency for uh, you know novel forms of exchange, but initially with a circle of trust that's pretty small, but people who want to get something something resolved. Um, maybe it's around uh, right-sizing the military, actually figuring out you know what we need as opposed to just spending tons on on arms, um, or what 21st century risk management in the financing arena can look like, agency spending, those kinds of things that become political footballs just instantly, but sort of feel like you know they become the pragmatic middle. I think the evidence is we kind of need to work there, and policy entrepreneurs can be a part of doing that. And sometimes, by the way, they can be academics, you know, people who engage from an academic platform, but again, have a healthy respect for what the political moment actually is, what uh, the barriers are, uh, why they're walking uphill when they're walking uphill. And don't just dismiss all that and sort of say, I'm not going to engage. You know, I'm going to put out my standard uh, article with the policy implications section at the, at the back end and launch into the world what I think should be done and leave the rest of those, I mean, those are two different ways of going. Yes, ma'am. How would you a distinction between the local maxima and the global maxima? And then sort of talked a lot about experimentation and taking risks later. And I'm trying to sort of reconcile. Um, how you discover your global maximum without exploring those local local maxima. You think about, mm. you know, William of Ockham didn't say to himself, well, I'm going to create this revolution and thinking about rights, right? I mean, he was just sassing the Pope, right, right at that moment. And, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, so his sassing the Pope turns into something that enters canon law, and then that all of a sudden mm -hmm. starts to be one of those ideas that, you know, sort of the way that Dowell talks about is it's not necessarily one that gets diffused in a sort of, like a pond ripple, but more like a fuse, mm. right? That it lights something up and it continues through time and then begins to expand that yeah. way. Um, you know, again, I don't know. Abraham had to go up to Canaan. He didn't even know why, right? But that launched kind of some pretty big things too. And so yeah. I guess my question for you is, you know, this whole idea of having our eyes on the global maximum, how do you get there without, without sort of having to try on all the local maximum? Well, you know, the, the honest answer is uh, I'm not sure. But let me add just a little bit to that. Um, number one, I think that you can only engineer this stuff to a certain degree. I mean, I'm assuming we are agents. We want to try. We want to be as effective as we can be. And there is an, an element of, you know, of, of allocating energies, I hope, in a number of different categories, not just one, let's say. That's the problem I have with the monopoly problem, or the monopolization problem in this conversation about social innovation. So I think the, the broader lens and a, 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 you know, a modicum of creativity and a willingness to take risks in multiple arenas would be good for this country and for many other countries, for the whole, for the whole world. I, having said that, I've got to acknowledge, um, again, as, as a student small s of history, that a number of the, the broadest changes are you know, are largely unplanned, or at least their scaling seems fortuitous, serendipitous. Um, we will never be able to fully foresee, and perhaps it's better that we not be able to fully control those things that happen, especially when they're tremendously positive. You could also tell, I'm sure, a flip side of set of stories about very awful things that went viral um, or went fuse like, you know, very quickly, and that's problematic. Um, then you need to think firewalls and protection and, and so on. But, you know, I do think there will always be those sources. And quite frankly, I think that a lot of the things that, that function in the realm of cultural innovation or institutional innovation, in the case of, you know, fundamental rights, uh, that quite a few probably have that quality. You know, no one imagined a broader social transformation. Um, it just happened that there was a certain readiness, you know, for, for some, set of, some set of reasons. I think that will probably always be with us. Um, I, I'd like to think we can up our odds of making constructive stuff happen. But if we're going to do it, we can't have blinders on. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I uh, really appreciate your broad look at this. Um, you know, this is a center that uh, is in a, a school of policy and planning and not in a business school, although most of these centers are in business schools, mm -hmm. frankly all of them. And so part of our effort to think through this is what should a, 
an effort like this in this kind of school look like? And uh, I really appreciate the dimensions of this that you bring, uh, which is, I think, closer in many ways to our interests uh, and gets at more of the reason we use the term social innovation, for example, as opposed to entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, but I, so I want to follow on that and ask you, uh, what uh, role do you think universities can play mm -hmm. in the kind of social movement or social innovation processes that you've mentioned? You, you alluded to that a little bit with, uh, you know, a um, policy entrepreneur maybe being at a university. But uh, one, one of the interesting things is studies of the impact of, you know, where do, you know, policy influence come from and ideas and information. At least in the short run, universities are not up at the top of the list mm. of where uh, that comes from. It's, you know, a lot of newspapers and think tanks and a lot of other things. And so I don't know if you had any thoughts on either this center or universities in general, if they're interested in this issue of social innovation, yeah. how can they be a Play a role. Well, a, a couple thoughts. And thank you for the question. Thank you, everybody. These have been great, great, great questions to think about. Um, first of all, I, I think that we shouldn't overlook the obvious. It's the kind of hidden in plain sight opportunity. Teaching the breadth, teaching the wealth of avenues more than just the one, um, is no small contribution exposing people, especially early in life, but I'm also thinking mid-career professionals, I'm also thinking people that we touch through things like professional ed programs, you know, to um, a wider set of ways of imagining important social change. But that in and of itself is an important contribution. Uh, I shared with Elizabeth earlier, uh, when she sort of asked, well, you know, are there institutions that are, that, are, that are doing that or taking the broader view? I think there are too few, so I think there's a great opportunity for you guys. and. I have a hard time even thinking of courses that exist that take this broader view. You know, I can think of kind of one or two out there where people are experimenting in their classroom year to year with trying to teach multiple pathways, multiple leverage points on what they variously call social change or social impact or, you know, people use different labels but have similar, similar concerns in mind. Um, I think there's another role and that is brokering public problem solving. Um, I've I done some work over the years thinking about civic capacity and governance, especially at the local level. Um, ironically, I've, I've served in government only at the federal level, but I'm passionate about cities and the local and, you know, places that are, that are systems where people have ongoing encounters with each other, not just kind of brief electoral uh, coalitions to get various things enacted. Um, they've got to deal with each other over time. I've had a lot of interest in how that stuff can work better and taught negotiation over the years and collaborative problem solving and so on. And it's my observation, I've written up some of this, but I'll just share with you the, the kind of headline that um, there are a range of different roles that intermediaries or brokers can play depending on the context and the moment. Timing, again, is, is important. But universities can be uh, quite effective intermediaries in ways that go beyond their instructional role or their applied research role. You know, let's create something that's useful for decision makers. Again, very wonderful, very terrific when it works out. Um, or even some of the other roles, things like, you know, the whole anchor institution conversation. Gee, we're also employers and we're developers of real estate. And I'm for thinking about all of those. But the importance of a neutral convener the importance of people that work with data and know how to enrich a conversation. Um, and even personal relationships, you know, individual faculty or staff, uh, people running initiatives who are trusted by particular players on the local scene and their ability to, to broker conversations that get something novel rolling. Um, I think those things are not to be overlooked. I'm not claiming to you, by the way, that universities are uniquely advantaged uh, to be brokers or intermediaries. I think there are a range of other organizations or other actors that can be effective too, but I don't think we, sh we should overlook that, that potential function, um, especially in your, in your own backyard, however you want to think about it. LA, Southern California, State of California, the West, the entire Pacific Ocean. And however you want to think about 
the, the scale of influence. Um, so those are, are a couple. And again, I, I personally think that pushing ourselves, let's call this last part a challenge to the professoriate, myself included, in all humility, um, let's be honest that you know the incentives in the profession have been wired for quite a while in the direction of arguably hyper-specialization, quite rarefied work. Um, I, I call journal articles deli slices of knowledge. You know, they're kind of rigorous but often extremely narrow, uh, difficult to relate to complex problems. Um, I don't mean to shortchange too much. I mean, they can be accum cumulative, right, and have a, an effect over time and they have a place, but there is this disconnect between a lot of academic knowledge production. I'm certainly not saying anything profound or original here. I think that, you know, institutions, um, while acknowledging a place for specialization and the conventional sort of output, can also be intentional rowing against that tide, you know, can make decisions to place bets, to ask broader questions. And uh, I, I use the community policing example for a reason. You know, it was a specific decision by an academic <laughs> institution uh, to enroll initially just a few fellow conspirators, people in the policing field, in the big, hairy, audacious goal of reinventing policing you know, of crafting a new model through a novel kind of conversation, a novel process. Um, it didn't emerge because academic papers were written and then something was adopted. It didn't emerge because just a few PDs did something and it went viral. It emerged because a thoughtful group got together over several years, several times a year, and did these deep dives, looking at the way policing is operating and dysfunctioning and getting uh, heavily criticized by community groups and others. Here again, I feel like LA is the perfect place to make that point. Uh, for given reasons, um, but not the only place, certainly. You know, but a thoughtful group of people said, this, this problem is not going to resolve itself. You know, it's not going to kind of spring out of one person's head. We need to create a collective learning mechanism. I think that universities um, bring fairly obvious assets to that kind of function, and relatively few institutions have ever done that. Yes, sir. So uh, at risk of repeating, uh a question that, that my colleague Jenny Schitz mentioned about um, without repeating that. Let me, let me get back to this uh, notion in you know, which I thought was really insightful about the, the unhealthy focus on the value proposition um, and how that can lead to, the, you know, I understand quite clearly the how one has to overmarket oneself and one has, has sold, but what I didn't quite get was the link that prevents a focus on the value proposition from ever linking to either service and government or or kind of institutional change. Why does it disconnect? Why doesn't, why can't the value proposition lead to, in, in, in my view, is kind of institutionalized change in yep. government and broader. So, yep. so can you maybe repeat why that focus kills the other? Sure. No, let me, let me, be, let me be clearer than I was. Um, first of all, I was arguing that the ability to define a value proposition in a really rigorous, deliberate way is a virtue, not a vice, okay. not a problem. That's a good thing. And then a kind of relentless working out, a strategy beyond just the value proposition itself is likewise a really healthy part of the tendency we've seen. I, I respect all of that. I think it's useful. Um, but. I think there are a number of reasons that it has, has not often led, or not often enough, to broader institutionalization. And here I would, and I hope I'm not just uh, playing semantics, here I would draw a certain distinction. I think that institutional innovations, like the ones I mentioned and, and others, um, are, are, have a different quality or have a different importance in this conversation. Uh, from institutionalization in the way that phrase is generically used. Um, I think that the way we conventionally use that, if you kind of look it up in a dictionary, what we mean is what Dowell talked about. Um, you know, adopting something that otherwise would just function on the margins, kind of start and stay small. We might use the word boutique. You know, um, use an even older metaphor, point of light, however bright it's tiny, 
that you scale it and it becomes the new normal. So you go from the Perry Preschool study to Head Start, just you know, massive scale and that sort of thing. So we use institutionalization to say, to mean that kind of thing. Um, I think that's different, as useful as it can be when it works out. And I don't think that even Teach for America, which would be called one of the larger you know, social innovation organizations by certain definitions over the last two decades, I don't even think that Teach for America is, is all that institutionalized. It has lots of client school districts, but that's another matter. Um, but th that's different from, and that's a rare example, right? There are very few TFAs out there. Um, that's different from institutional innovations that are qualitatively different from really excellent services or products. Institutional innovations have to change rules and roles. Those are, that's the definition of an institution. Um, and when institutions actually change, when you make the new normal for urban development, whether it be in a Medellin or a Bogota or in LA or a Boston or a fill in the blank, you know, that the public sector is going to think of itself as an investor that has the right to capture some of the return for public benefit. So where does that mean I've used That's tectonic to me. Yeah. That, that's that's a, a whole new normal. That's a paradigm shift potentially in the way we think about urban development. So I may have may have not used the, the terms in the, quite the appropriate context, but I'm still struggling to figure out why the narrow focus on the value proposition and working mm -hmm. out the details and all that then prevents these bigger changes that are the ultimate goal of? Well, I don't think that it inherently prevents it. I think that it's often been the case that it's one simply doesn't lead to the other. You know, that we don't have all that many examples of scale, number one. And I was also arguing, you, you may or may not agree, that the kind of monopolization of the conversation, um, not because, by the way, I think anyone set out to kind of cut off other conversations. They were just very determined to accomplish certain things and kind of latched onto certain ideas and even inspiring role models, including some amazing people, you know, the founder of Grameen and, and others. I, I think that there isn't an inherent barrier per se to this wider imagination, these multiple models, but I do think there is a diversion of attention and talent, energy, and sometimes money, to be very candid. Um, I think there's a narrowing and there is a certain opportunity cost to society when there is that kind of narrowing. And that will have to be the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me. Thank you.